I would like to preface my remarks by, first of all, thanking Monsignor Chido for this great opportunity. I'm very humbled to be able to be with you in the next three days. As Monsignor Chido has mentioned to you earlier, him and I have a long history together in good times and in bad, but mostly good times. But we were there for each other. I am, and he have now been a priest for over 37 years. And uh, unfortunately, I, because of my illness, uh, I'm a terrible asthmatic, I had to retire for medical reasons. Nonetheless, I still function within the archdiocese and also do the ancient extraordinary rite of the Mass at Fort Collins, Colorado every Sunday, which I love dearly. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. amen. Today, as we listen to this gospel, the gospel, of course, comes to us from the gospel of St. John in the third chapter. This is what we listen to today. It's only part of what this long discourse is all about. Let's put things in perspective first. Nicodemus, a member of the Sahedrin, we will find him in Scripture in three times in the Gospel of John. The first time, of course, is in this discourse in the middle of the night with our blessed Lord Jesus. The second time we see him again will be at the, in the presentation uh, with and defending Jesus with the Sahedrin, member also of the Sahedrin. And we will at the last, of course, see him with Joseph of Arimathea, when he will help anoint the body of our blessed Lord. And if you stop and think, Nicodemus was a man who was well respected by the Sahedrin, perhaps not so by the Pharisees. Nonetheless, in the middle of the night, he stows away and finds Jesus. He was curious. He's also a man of weak faith. And he knew that he wanted to wanted to learn more about what this Jesus is all about. And so thus begins this great discourse. And of course, in the middle of this discourse, our blessed Lord says, you know, you must be reborn again, not only with water, as St. John does, John the Baptist, but also with the Holy Spirit. Baptism, of course, for us. In those days, of course, he is unable to comprehend this terminology. And he says, how can a grown man like myself go back into my mother's room, womb and be reborn? And of course, Jesus continues on this course, and in time, he starts to comprehend. You know, our blessed Lord uses many methods to try to communicate with people. He uses parables to communicate with the vast masses. He will use veiled language, if you will, to deal with the Pharisees and those who oppose him. And again, he will, in a very soft way, deal with people who are anxious and who are wanting to seek the truth in a very gentle way, like he did at the conversation, long discourse with the woman at the well. And here we see him today with Nicodemus. And of course, Nicodemus, little by little, receives a conversion. Afterwards, he said, Holy Father, why did you kiss the baptismal font. And our Holy Father responded and he says, because here I had my second birth. Here I was reborn in Christ. And so, in a way, a reminder to us of what it really means to be baptized, that you and I are reborn in so many different ways. And as I said, at the, at the font of baptism, we begin our sacramental life in the church. Our blessed Lord has given us so many different instruments, the sacraments themselves, to assist us in our long struggle. And the struggle is primarily who is following us? Satan. Satan, the more closer you and I become to our blessed Lord, the more challenging it becomes because Satan is right pulling against us, driving us away from the Lord and the blessings and the graces that he bestows on us. There is an imagery in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament 
where uh, we see Moses struggling with his people who are murmuring constantly about this long journey to the promised land. And of course, our blessed uh, uh, God, Yahweh is upset with these people because they're stubborn and they failed in faith to listen to the words of Moses. And so there is a trial by sending serpents, and many of those people were being bitten. And of course, as Moses does so many times and during this long journey to the promised land, he pleads with Yahweh and says, please, be gentle. And our, the Lord God responds back and it says, very well, I will ask that you raise a bronze serpent and whoever looks at this serpent will be cured of their snake bites. Again, the imagery later on, transposition to the Holy Cross, the cross of our blessed Lord himself. You look at it, you see there our life, our autobiography. There again, you and I have been bitten by Satan. And our blessed Lord reaches out to us as we look at this cross with faith. It allows us, if you will, to bind our wounds and to heal us from the wounds of envy, the wounds of anger, lust, and spiritual boredom. So many of us continue on carrying that baggage of our own defects and failing to look at the cross and to see in that dying Jesus that he has redeemed us and he wants us in so many ways to be with him. And for us, in each one of us, he helps us with our defects, as we say in Latin, indoles, those things that prevent us from coming to our Lord. All of us in this church have been sinners in so many ways. You know, the greatest sins that you and I commit are not necessarily those sins against commission, but they are the sins of omission, the omission, sins that we fail to do, sins that we fail to do for one another, and most of all, for the procreation of our own soul, that we neglect our soul in so many ways. One of the journeys that we start in our pilgrimage since baptism is that we have an obligation to one another to help to not only sanctify myself, but to sanctify those around us. The great poet William Shakespeare said that the opposite of love is not hate. He says it is indifference, not to care, to see and not to see, to know and do nothing about it. There is a wonderful poem by Stuttgart Kennedy, a uh, 19th century Irish poet, and he writes about this indifference in relative to our blessed Lord himself. And he says, entitled, uh, When Jesus Came to Bringingham, that being Bringingham, England, and it goes something like this. When Jesus came to Golgotha, they hanged him on a tree. They drove great nails through and through and hands and feet and made a calvary. They crowned him with a crown of thorns. Red were his wounds and deep. For those were crude and cruel days and human flesh was cheap. When Jesus came to bring in him, they simply passed him by. They would not hurt a hair of him. They only let him die. For men had grown more tender, and they would not give him pain. They only just passed down the street and left him in the rain. Still Jesus cried out, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And still it rained the winter rain that drenched him through and through. The crowds went home and left the streets without a soul to see. And Jesus crouched against the wall and cried for Calvary. My dear people, indifference is a terrible sin. It is neglect. 
It impedes. It destroys. And so you and I have this opportunity in the next three days to explore not only this indifference, but the conversion that comes about it when we do love. So let us, and I invite you to share with me this, this wonderful opportunity to explore ourselves in the presence of Almighty, um, our Almighty Jesus. Most of all, to be able to see in ourselves those things that keep us from him. Lent is a beautiful opportunity, particularly now during mid-Lent in this Letari Sunday, for us to explore, to see, to convict ourselves with the gospel, and to ask for his forgiveness, and to ask for his grace, that you and I, as adopted sons and daughters, will ever remind closer for that wonderful day of the resurrection on Easter. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.